Welcome back to another episode of Radical Narrative. I am your host, Milan Tatusis, coming at you from Palmaker Indian Reserve 114. Today on the podcast, I'm sitting down with Rachel Snow. She has been traveling across Western Canada, Treaty Territory, with her colleague Deanne Kasokio, discussing Canada's approach to the agricultural settlements that are taking place. Their informational session is called Beyond Cows and Plows, The Big Picture, Understanding the Treaty Right to Agriculture. Their next event is March 21st at the Rusty McDonald Library in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I'm going to link that in the show notes so you can take a look at that if it interests you. We sat down and recorded this minutes ago. It's just finishing in the editing software. I really hope you enjoy this episode. And as always, be sure to stay tuned and listen in. Awesome. Thanks for making time with me, Rachel. I know you've been busy. You're doing this amazing tour where you're discussing treaty nationhood and in particular cows and plows. And I'm seeing that create a lot of discussion and conversations on Facebook, which is awesome and which is great. But I also want to give you space to introduce yourself, who you are, where you come from, and ultimately positioning you um, as, as basically, you know, a very authentic voice that's coming from the grassroots. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, this is uh, Rachel Snow. Uh, my Indian name or my uh, spirit name or whatever it is, is Muia, which means Thunder Woman. And I am uh, the second eldest child of uh, late Reverend Dr. Chief John Snow. My father was a longtime chief, statesman, ambassador, elder, and he work to solidify the place of our people in uh, what would, I guess, in uh, Canadian history, but remembering that Canada was always part of our history. Mm -hmm. So the legacy that my late father built up, the things that he wanted to see happen in this country, the uh, resurgence of our spirituality, the um, continued adherence to the obligations we hold under uh, with our with as representatives or as First Nation people on this land and the agreements that we made with the newcomers or the settlers or the crown in uh, Great Britain, he wanted to make sure that we were well versed and that we were able to continue providing that strong voice for First Nations and Indigenous uh, peoples. So right now i have been um i've always been a, a mother a single mom i've raised four children i have 10 grandchildren now another one on the way and i am a graduate of the college of law university of saskatchewan but i did not uh, try to uh, do the c pled or uh, take the bar course because I felt that uh, I wanted to challenge the Canadian legal system and I wanted to help our own Indigenous legal traditions or systems have a resurgence. So that's primarily what I've been working at at the grassroots level, trying to get our communities or our our leadership to look at restoring that the harmonious balances, the collective thinking, uh, the spirituality that always existed for our people. So that's primarily the work I do. I do work as a policy analyst. I've worked on a lot of different things uh, from glad you reports to uh, writing documents um, for tribal councils or for chiefs and councils sitting on boards, whether it's education or nationhood or treaty related. I've done a, I've been doing this work, I think, you know, since I've been 18. So it's been about, yeah, 42 years of working within the same area. So that's who I am. I live in my community. I'm on my home reserve in Minithni, Coldwater, Morley, Alberta, and we are Iahe Nakoda, a branch of the Oseti Sagoi, the, uh, the seven uh, tribes of the Sioux Nation. Awesome. Awesome. I really like it. I really like it. Really strong positionality there. And that's one thing we're trying to hit home on the podcast in this era of pretendians is we want to find guests who have strong community connections and, and ultimately who know what they're talking about. And you're demonstrating that. So that's awesome. 
I want to ask, start off with the question in terms of treaty, in terms of treaty nationhood, nation to nation, because that is a narrative that I feel does exist politically amongst grassroots, but it's also not a common narrative amongst Canadians, but even our own people. Like our own people are ultimately are forgetting that we are indigenous nations on our homeland and ultimately are basically, you know, surrendering a lot of our nationhood to a settler state. So how do we position treaty in this conversation? What does that mean? Well, I think uh, before we can, uh, before we can talk about uh, anything about ourselves as the first or the original peoples of this land, it starts with, um, it starts with um, an acknowledgement that we were placed here by the creator. We have a covenant or we have a treaty with the creator and we have an obligation to fulfill being placed here as his gifted children. We were placed here to safeguard and to steward the land, the waters, the plants, the animals, all of creation to respect that balance. And when newcomers came in, uh, originally, you know, in the uh, 14th, 15th century, when they started to come to North America or to Turtle Island, what uh, they wanted, of course, they were looking for land. If you look at the history of non-First Nation people and study uh, some of the European history, you'll see that there were they did not really have democratic governments and that they were coming this way as explorers looking for new land and looking for a new way to govern themselves. And so they come to a place where we sit as uh, collective voices. So that's, you know, very important to remember that when we start talking about treaty or when we start talking about the relationship between uh, Canadians or any settlers who have come into North America, we have to acknowledge, first of all, the, you know, thousands of years of history of governance development of social and cultural development that was that existed already and we're not teaching that or that's not available to be taught or not being taught well so then we only remember dates like um when we talk about treaty and uh, as i'm going around with uh my um partner deanne casocchio as we're going around i do the um the opening talks on treaty what it means and what I'm talking about not necessarily is um, the historic number treaty, because when we talk about treaty, most of our people think we're talking about, uh, you know, treaty number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, or Robinson Huron Treaty or the Eastern uh, treaties with truck house clauses. Uh, they 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 are looking at treaties with settlers, and what we're talking about is the original ways that we governed ourselves. And uh, we spoke to um, an elder last week, Jimmy Ochis, and he reminded us about the uh, Royal Proclamation 1763, the Treaty of Niagara 1764, when uh, Chief Pontiac brought together, you know, thousands of First Nation leaders. And we agreed at that time to exist peacefully and to exist peacefully with the newcomers. So the Peace and Friendship Treaty and the spirit of who we are had early beginnings that are not necessarily documented in a historic number treaty or documented that way, but they are documented in the two row wampum. If you look at the two row wampum and you see the two lines that forever uh, go forward, but never cross into each other's spheres or don't, uh, don't uh, inhibit uh, the other, you can see the intention of our first uh, chiefs and leaders that we would go side by side along with settler Canadian society the British society whoever it was that we would continue to exist and that's how we would go forward so we're talking about um, the initial relationship that we had as first peoples to the land as first peoples with creator as first peoples as a spiritual understanding that we, our existence was tied to the land and that everything we have comes from and remains with the land, which is why we agreed to share it. Um, and that was our concept because we, know, we knew we did not own the land because how could we own a part of ourselves? So that common misconception about 
how European people have, uh, you know, made it into property, made the land into property, how they have uh, established that kind of a regime is very different from the way that we look at land as being a part of who we are and um, the parts that we, that go on forever because we were made, born, and will die in this land. So that's a different, uh, a different way of thinking of that relationship. And that's where the, then when we start talking about the historic treaties, then you're gonna have to, again, have our treaty First Nation perspective first. And you're right, that is not being taught. It hasn't been passed down, but those are the stories, the oral traditions, the um, things that we know happened at treaty signing time, whether there was uh, months of ceremony, whether uh, certain tribes or different peoples ventured to other treaty signing areas or communicated with their relatives or another similar linguistic group. Those things were happening so that our people could establish or could uh, have an understanding of, of what was happening and make the best um, deals or make the best negotiations for our future survival. That's that was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I really like it. I really like it. And and the reason I like it is because the reality is is that we were always capable of peace and diplomacy. Like we were always capable of sitting at the table. We were always capable of of practicing a diplomatic relationship. And I feel, you know, as a scholar, as somebody who grew up in my community too, is that there's a, we're in an era of compromise. Uh, we're in an era of selling out. And the big question for me is why are we always selling out? Like, why are we always, you know, taking uh, a shitty deal and ultimately even negotiating things from the perspective of capital, from the perspective of currency? Um, but this is really good foundational, foundational information for our listeners who are new to this conversation. Um, and, and I know, do know a lot of our listeners are critical of, of colonialism. They are critical of capitalism. Um, so what would you say to people in terms of having to understand the core reality of, 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 of what we're talking about here, that, that this is our lands and territories, that we've made these agreements, that we made this relationship and, and how is it not fostering or how is it not what we intended it to be? Like, what's the big problem here? Well, I think at the core, the core relationship you're talking about is spiritual. Mm. The core relationship we're talking about is that the things that we do are done in our languages with ceremony, with traditions, with adherence to the balance and the harmony that exists in our collective. So if we had societies uh, prior to the coming of the settlers that had um, recognized all the components of our collective and that would include the elders, the women, the children. And then we come face to face negotiating with a society that where only the men, uh, the white patriarchy is the voice to uh, negotiate. I think we're already going to have misconceptions and we're already going to build up a series of distrust and also that our, our worldview or the things that we believe are necessary for harmony to continue will not be taken into consideration because they're not taken into consideration in that society. So when we're coming to look at what what are some of the problems, uh, the problems existed from the very first person wanting to speak to an authority figure within a band. So we have within our, you know, within our nations and it's not true this is not a blanket statement or a cookie cutter approach for all nations because some nations the Haudenosaunee had the the longhouse and they had a, a special a specific governance system with matriarchs you come west and I'm speaking more of the Plains Indians kinds of uh, governance systems we had either hereditary leadership um, systems or or hereditary le leadership ways of doing things or practices or we had, uh, we had a balance between the men and the women. And if you think about it, the women were always tied to the land or, or words for the mother earth, you know, in Kushin, uh, like the, for grandmothers, we, and from a coach, for mother earth, our words uh, sort of give that, 
feminine, I don't want to say feminine, uh, well, the, the woman's energy or the woman's spirit. So when you have that uh, idea of our people in place, and then you look at the patriarchy, the white male patriarchy that looks at land as property, there's a huge disconnect. And how do we begin to undo that disconnect? And for a lot of our people, what they try to do is um, they learn the colonial structures, they learn the colonial ways of thinking, and all they do is, you know, try to put the word feminine in front of uh, feminine, you know, property, um, whatever, assembling or disassembling or logistics or negotiations. That's going to work because you're not getting to the essence. You're not getting to the core or the base of what it is. And what it is, is that uh, women have, uh, women are able to give life. Women are able to give life. And that is what the planet does. That's what the plants do. That's, that's what our lives are focused around. And so our people understood this very well that, uh, you know, and that's where the term in our treaties for as long as the waters flow. Uh, that's a woman giving birth for as long as, you know, when the water breaks and we're, we're, we're giving birth. And so we're having new generations come along. It's, uh, and it can also mean because we take, um, because we take responsibility for the physical elements, such as uh, the land, the water and uh, the grass, we're talking about life. We're talking about all things in creation. We're talking about the things that are going to go on forever. That is how we're looking at this relationship with uh, the larger, um, within the larger Canadian context or within Canadian society. We're looking at it as a relationship that is based on the things that we have always known, the things that go on into perpetuity, the things that will always be true and will always exist, the sun shining, uh, women being able to give life and plants or animals uh, growth uh, for food, or for whatever it is that we need or creation needs to keep going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. I really like it. And I do know a lot of our listeners will probably be hearing this for the first time. So I'm really trying to like position it from like somebody hearing this for the first time and asking these questions. Um, so we're really establishing, you know, what historically our peace and diplomacy projects were, how we operate as a people. And then you ultimately did highlight like this clash of paradigms in terms of how this white European Western patriarchy governance style clashes with our governance style and that this clash has been going on for quite some time. And then ultimately now we're in this era, this new era where we're like in a settlement era, right? So there's these contemporary conversations around treaty, around rights, um, inherent rights, treaty rights. And then ultimately that brings us to the conversation of cows and plows, um, which is a great example to talk about some of the problems that we see in terms of our peace and diplomacy project with the settler state. So I'll ask that question. You are going around doing this tour to explain cows and plows and unpack that concept for grassroots people. Um, can you give us an insight on why you're doing that and why this is important? I just like how you segued into the most critical part of the conversation <laughs> and drew that in. Bravo. Uh, I'm more, uh, bravo. Mylon, that was well done. <laughs> well, it's actually uh, a lot to unpack because when we talk about, again, so we're going back to our understanding as First Nations people, we have a way of governance, we have languages, we have ceremonies, we have our own governance systems, our own sort of, I guess, you know, if you want to use the colonial terms, we have our own education, childcare systems that all exist within a collective or within especially within uh with strong kinship bounds um we are you know bound together uh through kinship a lot of our words have specificity in uh understanding who who you are in relation to your family and the generations that have uh come through so i don't think it's very easy for pretendians to go around and find their generational roots because a lot of times when you're with First Nation people, the first thing they will start to do is they will start to talk about their family. They will start to talk about their, you know, I, I began by talking about my late, uh, my late father. And then uh, my late mother too, as well was a Pachan Indian from Yuma, Arizona. So that I feel is another reason why 
Uh, my dad really wanted us to understand, go to meetings, sit with elders, sit in ceremony, go to Sundance, go to the things uh, where there were discussions or, you know, even visiting people sitting uh, around a fire or camping or having tea with elders and people to talk about these things because they're philosophical. It's a philosophical understanding and it builds over a period of time. You can't just get it from watching uh, something online or from uh, reading anything. It's the skill or the practice of doing it, which was, you know, a lot of our First Nation uh, education systems, if you actually look at them, they were more based on skill building because you can't learn how to tan a hide by watching it on YouTube. You physically have to do the work. You physically have to go out and follow all the protocols and then do the um, the tanning of that hide and making it into uh, something that you can use following, you know, the respect and the um, all the steps that were handed down to our people for generations. It's a, uh, it's a practice of doing something. So when you start to understand that we practice these things in doing them, that's how we gained our skill. Then we take uh, a sharp corner or uh, we veer off and we start looking at words. We start looking at the words of the treaty. So what I've been telling people is that we have to remember our people, our ancestors, when they went into treaty, their understanding, and this is what some call some sometimes called the spirit and intent of treaties, was that they were sharing the land. So the idea that treaty number six, treaty number seven has right on there uh, the you know the uh, the Nahia or the, the whatever band and Stony Band and the Blackfoots at this location location hereby seed and surrender. Uh, that is, those are not words that we understand in our language. First of all, we don't understand that connection to land where you can be, uh, where you can cut yourself off from the land because our survival depends on the land. So at the very front of the treaties is a big misunderstanding. The sharing component that we have for treaty, that's the component that needs to come forward. Mm -hmm. Trudeau and the federal government keeps talking about reconciliation. Reconciliation includes our perspective. Our perspective is that we shared the land. So why are we now in this position where we're having to give up what little we have in order to um, in order to continue to exist in our own in our own land, in our own country? And the, the reason for it, again, goes back to uh, some of the colonial things that have been done. With the kinship that I talked about, we have a strong understanding of kinship. When you break that kinship through residential schools, through the 60s scoop, through herding people onto reserves, through making them become farmers when they have lifestyles uh, where they're semi-nomadic or nomadic, uh, going and hunting and relying on hunting and gathering for their subsistence. When you start to break that system, where these people are starving, they're isolated, they're put into basically uh, uh, these uh, sort of camps, and then they're not allowed to leave unless they have passes, uh, you're starting to see that you're, you've isolated and you've cut off uh, their way of life. You've cut off and taken away the children, so you've broken that pattern of kinship and the role of our parents, uh, grandparents, and some of our, in our communities, all these things, the trauma that's starting to build now at this point, how does it, how does it see fruition or how does it end? It ends when our people use terms like um, economic sovereignty. It ends when our people use terms like um, we're implementing the treaty provisions by taking a one-time pay. Mm. This is what is happening right now with the, the section on the treaty right to agriculture. The reason uh, Dee Kosokio and I started going around was because we were looking at these settlement agreements and she is a lawyer, I'm a graduate of a uh, Canadian law school. And we were looking at the agreements and we were noticing that the, uh, there was a release and indemnity clause for Canada the release clause states that um, 
you will forever, you know, the band, whatever your name is, uh, just use whatever the John Smith band uh, forever releases um, Canada and its heirs, assignees, ministers. It goes, the list goes on and on and pretty well names the kitchen sink of Canada uh, can never be uh, asked or taken or um, subjugated to defense, any kind of uh, future funding, negotiations, anything in this area with this one-time pay. And then it also says, uh, further to that, not only are we taking the one-time pay, we're indemnifying Canada so that none of our future ancestors or future descendants, grandchildren, collectives, people that we know and the kitchen sink can ever sue Canada in this area again. So the treaty was an agreement to share the land. The treaty was to go on forever, for as long as the sun shines. The sun will shine till the year 5,000, whatever it is. Uh, and the waters, uh, for as long as the waters flow, as long as women can uh, give birth, uh, that's how long it's going to go. And we already know that Canada tried to sterilize First Nation women mm -hmm. within the, um, when, uh, during the residential school era. And uh, as long as the grass grows, as long as there's life, as long as there's plant life and there's food growing. So all of those things combined make, uh, the, make it so that this is a perpetual agreement. This is an agreement that does not stop uh, at 10 years. It doesn't stop with a one-time payment. Our ancestors wanted to see us, the seventh generation come in, and they wanted to make sure that we we're actually holding down the line or planning for the next seven generations. Mm. So that's our job, is to make sure the next seven generations will have something. Mm. And by saying we're taking a one-time pay and being able to buy land, our own land, and uh, exercise some kind of agriculture sovereignty on it or economic sovereignty is completely stepping away from the original intentions of the tree. I like it. I really like how you said it there. Um, because for me, like in my school of thought is that um, in my school of thought is like, it, it's our land and we did agree to live in peace and coexistence with it. So why would I use this money to buy land that already belongs to me and my people? Like, why would I buy my own territory back? It doesn't make sense. And I really like how you talked about how treaty and our intentions with this relationship was intergenerational for the duration of, of forever. All right. And then now these one time payments are showing up where there's pinpointing individual payouts to individuals, which doesn't make sense to me, because as you highlighted earlier in our episode, we were a collective people like everything was collective. And more importantly, everything was operating from an intergenerational framework. And it baffles me, especially coming at it from Saskatchewan, that agribusiness and agriculture is like a multi-billion dollar industry since since settlers got here. And then so how do we even quantify quantify that in terms of justice, right? Because they're making more money, they've been taking money, and they're going to continue to make money on the land that's ours, and they're giving us these one-time payments. And it, like the math doesn't math from a critical analysis, but the common knowledge and the common narrative being pushed by lawyers, being pushed by settlers, the federal government, is that this is a good thing. I think the majority of... Uh... Settlers, though, and uh, lawyers um, who are pushing this, that this is a good thing, they're non-native. Mm. They certainly have no understanding of treaty from our perspective. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the prior claims that first went through with regard to cows and plows and Treaty 8, I don't think there was ever a treaty argument made mm. about uh, the fact that this was going to, that there was a release and there was an indemnity clause. And then when concerns were raised, because we have our own First Nation people who are lawyers now, but we do have a handful of First Nation lawyers who are also um, schooled in treaty. They understand the treaty components. When we have those people coming to the table or looking at these documents, we're starting to see uh, a huge gap, a huge, um, and, and actually the onus is on Canada and the non-native lawyers to explain this, uh, to give both sides and to explain this fully 
to First Nations so that they know exactly what they're giving up. And since that wasn't happening, that's why we started to, we called it the Miracle Bannock Tour and just uh, Treaty Right to Agriculture and for short cows and plows, because we knew we had to get into communities where our grassroots people are. We knew we had to tell them what it really meant. And we knew that we weren't going to be supported because, like I said before, the kinship break from residential schools, that not only affected uh, the collective, but it, it, and our family structures, the clan structures, then it uh, infects the um, the collective or the clans that come together. And so that we have now more or less a system of, um, especially when Indian Affairs interfered into our governance practices and set up elections, we have more or less Indian leadership that is more... Um, obliging, I'll put it that way, yeah. to the federal government and follows their program dollars and doesn't want to bite the hand that feeds them and has been in this beat down residential schools position for a number of years, not wanting to hurt or harm the little that they get, which is very sad because our, our people were warriors. Yeah. Uh, when my late dad was out there in 1970 reading the red paper, we had chiefs who rode on the constitutional train. We had chiefs who went right over to England and lobbied Queen Elizabeth directly. We had chiefs who were still the last fragments, I guess, of our traditional chiefs who wanted to see something better for our people and wanted to make sure that they held Canada to account. They wanted to, they knew in their, with that warrior spirit in that warrior blood, that agreement that we made, that covenant that we signed has to keep going. It can never end. But nowadays, um, the leadership or the people who are out there negotiating for us seem to think it's okay to um, settle, take something less. And they're, they're using so many things to justify it. It's, it's uh, such a slap in the face to our ancestors right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I feel you hit the nail on the head um, when you said that there was there is this kinship breakdown that residential school really did a number on our kinship systems, but also our knowledge systems. Like like this, like you said, you highlighted that a lot of these these this knowledge exists in oral histories. You have to be in the community. You have to be around people who maintain it. And I know there's pockets of people out there who maintain this all across North America. But if you're not in these circles or you're not reconnecting to your family systems and you're simply just going to, you know, university and learning Western history, Western law, like this is going to be news to you. And there's people embedded in, you know, settler colonial legal systems that are operating from a paradigm that isn't ours, that's operating with outcomes that aren't for us. They're for the settler state. And I also like how you highlighted that um, Indian Act governance or, you know, governance today is is in a position of of um, ultimately not wanting to bite the hand that feed them, feeds us. But at the same time, what how I recognize that is that we don't necessarily have Indian agents in our communities anymore. It's almost as if like our governance systems right now at the table with the government are the Indian agents and simply delegating and, you know, doing the the work of that um, that model. So it's still alive today. Like I see it, I, I'm living on Palm Acre and it's a real um, challenge to navigate. And I guess that's the question I have for you now is, is what do we need to do? How do we navigate this? And ultimately what needs to happen? Well, I think uh, for uh, the thing that helped our ancestors, the things that saved our people were their prayers, mm. were the, um, the sacrifices that were made to ensure that the next generation would would come they, those um those uh prayers the uh understanding the relationship with the land and calling on our ancestors the guides the spirits to assist us in the work that we're doing is very important um as we step out right now as um as d and i uh, have been uh as you know, on our you know so-called tour, but uh, the first place we went to 
in White Bear were ready to, you know, go live and put it on TikTok, put it on Facebook, record it. But when we got there, there was a pipe ceremony. So then everything just stopped them. There's a pipe ceremony. So then we go right into that ceremonial thinking. We're not taping. We're not recording. Uh, we had somebody there who was saying, well, we have to let everybody know because they're going to be so disappointed. And I thought, I don't, we, when you hit this spot, you do not function on white man time or TikTok or Facebook or mm -hmm. people who are online waiting to be disappointed. <clears throat> You've been given a gift and a reminder of who we are. And you follow that reminder and that gift and do that action because that is the most powerful thing you can do in that in that moment. Uh, you may think uh, getting, you know, 10,000, 15,000, 30,000 subscribers or people watching you is important. No, the importance is putting that good thinking, that good energy, heightening or placing ceremony and the sacredness of what we're trying to do at the top that is the most profound or the greatest thing that we can do as we're starting to try to educate people. It's, um, yes, we want to be able to reach um, people out on social media or in other places, which is why, you know, I've, I've always had a difficulty. I do TP talks in the summer, but I don't want to broadcast them because I don't think um, culture or understanding the oral history or the strengths of learning in our systems should be, I don't think you should be able to do it like in a drive-through situation. I really object to that. I learn by sitting with elders. I learn by uh, sitting around a fire and hearing the conversations and by listening and by being on the land and, you know, smelling the smoke, feeling the wind, drinking fresh water. Those things are irreplaceable when you're watching a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get that. So you're not going to get the heightened level or the the strength of the power the beauty of that spirituality and that's where a lot of our people are that's where a lot of our people are at you know aside from posting that they're at a send dance or something or you know showing their really nice uh um, clothing or things that they're wearing for some ceremonial event which i disagree with uh those things that we do with our hearts and fully connecting to the universe that's the change that's where the energy is going to start to not only um change us but the prophecy that our own people would destroy treaty the prophecy that our own we would be fighting our own people the the the, the prophecy of hope is that other people will emerge mm -hmm. that there will be another nation the rainbow nation that there will be people from all backgrounds and all colors who start to see um, the spiritual path, the connection between all things, the cosmos, the universe, the power, the beauty, and just the, the awe that we have as First Nation people. When that happens, uh, that's when we're going to see real change. And that's not monetary. That's not economic sovereignty. That's nothing that you can put in a bottle or sell. That's something that is within each of us in our blood memory, it's within each of us in our languages, it's within each of us in as, you know, having been placed here as special people. I'm very proud, you know, I'm Iai Nakoda. This is who I was born into. And when I go uh, to the final camp, I'll see my family, I'll see my relatives, and they'll know that I did everything I could here on this plane to help. And they're on that plane assisting me right now in what I'm trying to do. I really like it. And I feel a lot of our young people need to hear this. A lot of our podcast listeners need to hear this, that that community connection matters, land-based relationships matter. I was just posting today about how I feel like the last 10 years have been this economic sovereignty, neoliberal approach. And I just, I, I got this feeling like the last few weeks that I feel like the tide's turning in again, where now we're getting a bit more, um, 
um, bold and more radical and more critical. And I always tell people to think critically about these things. Like we need the critical thought because people kind of just roll with it. I love how you're critiquing social media because that's very valid that social media is not necessarily a community connection. Like you could follow as much, you know, indigenous people as you want, but you're not necessarily there doing the work. Um, and, and I, and I will, like, I, I view this and position this specifically for our indigenous listeners, but what about the average common Canadian settler listening to this? How can they mobilize and organize on their side of the treaty relationship in terms of, um, you know, practicing and maintaining this, this kinship system we have with them through peace and diplomacy? Well, I guess that's really a question for our allies. I mean, uh, they purport to know how we think. So, you know, I don't want, sh should I play that game? Should I uh, be that uh, devil's advocate? Because they'd like to use that word a lot <laughs> and say, well, I'm going to be the devil's advocate and I'm going to tell you why that system is going to not work for you people. Um, I think that uh, the settlers have been in the driver's seat for a while. They don't have a learner's license. They don't, they don't have a license. They don't have a learner's license. And they've been trying to guide the canoe or the car that is Canada, and they've been doing it for a while, and they're off the road. They've, they've ruined the roads. They've ruined the vehicles, the canoes, the cars, whatever. They have to get out of their system and their thinking because we're all not going to go forward if we don't do some of the sustainable things, mm -hmm. the adaptations that we're talking about as First Nation people. And it's hard because it's like we had the answer to what was um, the purpose of our uh, our people as as nations and our placement here in North America, we had our we had a good idea and a very well balanced life with uh, very strong ties to our families, a good kinship relationship, a good relationship to the land and the animals. We had love, we had laughter, we had hope. And then when we believed that the settlers coming in were similar people, that they also valued those things, that's when we started to experience, um, that's when we started to experience that, no, they, were, they had a completely different agenda. And I don't think our ancestors really knew how much the non-natives would uh would what the to what extremes they would go to to get the land they didn't anticipate the kids being taken out they didn't anticipate you know being told that you have to be sed sedent uh, you have to be you have to be uh you can't be moving around you have to be sitting in one spot on your reserves here are the implements become farmers and that's your way of life now. You no longer pick or gather wherever you did. And they didn't understand that our picking and gathering, um, I've heard this too from non-Native people. They say, um, well, the reason you roamed around is because you picked and gathered all in one place and you took everything and so you, you moved on. And I thought, wow, that's just really some white thinking. Because the way we were raised is to always take enough and leave something because other people are going to be coming to eat other plants or other animals also need the fruits or some of the things that we're picking. We've never overpicked in one area because that's just greed. And we, we weren't, we didn't think like that. And that's why we were even sharing the land because we didn't say to you, pay up front. This is what we want. This is where you can stay. And, you know, you have to stay in this corner. We didn't, we didn't, we were, we were never unkind people. We were strong. We were we were willing to um, share what we have because we knew we lived in the most beautiful place that we had uh, the strongest connection, and that our people were always going to be this beautiful, vibrant people going forward. We didn't anticipate that our children would be taken away, that our languages would be banned, and that uh, we'd see this uh, resurrection of Indian. Uh, act councils, chiefs, leaders who were so broken and so weak that they no longer stood for the things that were integral to our original, our original ancestors, the people who originally signed treaty, the prayer people, the medicine people, 
And that treaty was signed not by one headman. There might be one headman who made the mark on the treaty, but at times of treaty, we have a story within my own family, within my uh, within my son's in-laws, where uh, one of the one of the people who went to treaty was a young boy. He rode on a donkey. He rode because he had to help his grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I said, so that tells me a couple of things that there were children and that there were women that went to the treaty signing because it wasn't just about, you know, one chief going over there and signing. It was about the community or the collective. It was about ceremony because we had nine pipes. So we had to go through those pipes before we even sat with uh, the representatives of the queen. We had to do our processes first. That's how strong we are, were as a people. And that's why there's still pockets of us today, I think, Mylan, because we're still following those, those paths. We'll, we're still following up on those stories. We're still following up on those directions. And I think that's where allies, um, if they want to want to know, or like, you know, definitely watching your podcast, um, as well as in some of the events or things that we're going that we're doing. I mean, they can, they're welcome to come out too. If we're in the area, we will be in Saskatoon on the 21st and to come into here to hear our perspective, because then maybe they as critical thinkers will start to see that Trudeau or the governments that uh, are representing them are not holding, um, are not holding up to their end of the bargain because they still don't know what we're talking about. It's 2024 and they're still making settlement agreements that terminate our rights, our special existence, our special existence and our rights, which are the things that will save all people, this country, the global TP village, that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like what you're saying because, uh, and I love this conversation because it is asserting us as original peoples that we're here and that the Canadians are on that dynamic or the settlers are on the other side of this relationship. And I love how you answered that question where you you basically said, that's your canoe, you decide what's going on over there and that this is our side of the relationship. This is what we're trying to work on. Um, and I love that analogy and I love even the two-row wampum reference because it does really position this relationship. And, um, and the big question, well, it's not even a question. The observation I have is that we have people jumping ship from our canoe into that canoe, which is really weird and creating a lot of problems for us. Um, so yeah, people really need to pick their canoe and, and maintain, again, this peace and diplomacy project we have here. And then also what's coming up is, is history. History matters in this conversation, not the Western colonial history, but a critical analysis of history, even making reference to Chief Pontiac and, and that treaty and how these narratives existed and were, were passed down over time in terms of how do we engage in peace and, peace and diplomacy with these people. And the reality is, is we're living and breathing who we are as a people still here in the Americas. Like this is our lands. These are our territories. We're living and breathing it. And and Canada is a, is a great work of settler legal fiction, right? Because they're trying to assert themselves and and take over what is is rightfully ours. And and yeah, it, it really speaks to me and I feel it would speak to a lot of our, our listeners. Um, but I do want to ask and highlight this question, this, give you this question too that I'm observing and I know a lot of people are observing it, is that you, you and Deanne are, are under attack. <laughs> You're under attack. Yeah. And uh, that's really wild to me because we're technically all family and, and kinship people and have value systems and morales, but, but, but things seem to be getting pretty um, ugly out there. Um. Well, we, I think we anticipated because we have a fairly good understanding. I have been writing certainly in this area for a few years about the Indian Act councils and the fact that our councils are more yes men and Indian agents in our communities uh, rather than leaders. And that it's actually the leaders or the hereditary families that are in communities that are taking up, uh, you know, uh, picking up the arrow and the spear and going forward because it's it's within our it's within our hereditary rights it's within our um, it's within our you know the directions or the things that were given to us I know D said that has said that that she's doing this because she has to she has a responsibility uh, her grandmother and the fact that she was a descendant of Big Bear. Uh, Big Bear's youngest, I think she she talks about a horse child that was, uh, she's a descendant from that line. 
And so she understands the hereditary um, onus that is on her as not only as um, a, a descendant of the original people who were signing or working on treaty or leadership at that time, but that she is also trained and skilled as a lawyer and as a practicing lawyer who's practiced for, you know, 15 years with the, um, with, within the Canadian Bar Association or with the um, Saskatchewan, um, um, through the Saskatchewan uh, 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 Bar she's been practicing. So she's very well aware of uh, the uh, mainstream legal intricacies and how, um, you know, to file documents, the pleadings and how things are read or read down. Uh, and I have, you know, some background in this too, because this is how you're trained when you go into law school is that you're, you're reading documents and you're trying to find um, the issue and trying to find, you know, what, how you make an argument. Uh, so I understand. Uh, I just don't necessarily agree with the things that they find egregious, mm -hmm. things that they find egregious, you know, that your, your property line is, uh, somebody is, you know, putting a spoke over or a, uh, a fence a quarter billionth of a centimeter over and then there's a fight and it goes to civil court and there's got to be a payout and that's so egregious everybody understand I don't understand that because you know the whole of the land is there to be used and this tiny fence line that really is in the big picture um stupid uh why argue or fight over that like I, I some uh, parts of their law that were very um uh that are practiced, I, I just thought were meaningless. But the things that I thought were meaningful, you know, um, caring for your children and maintaining that relationship, um, that, wasn't, that wasn't part of their directive. That wasn't part of um, what they felt was important. So then again, like coming into the system, trying to learn and argue as a Canadian legal thinker means I have to let go of um, how I think and how what my frame of reference is what my uh, worldview is things that don't bother me have to suddenly bother me uh, so it's 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 quite difficult to I have to be what I, I said I, I have to become a greedy anal person and when I become this greedy anal person I don't like that person and why would I ever want to be that person? If that's what the system is trying to make me, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm able to, um, I don't think I'm able to suit up and follow that through. So then it becomes a challenge again, because I see these women at meetings. I see women uh, often saying it's for our children. We're thinking about our children. They're crying. They feel such strong emotion about this, but I can see the leaders, non-native, and native men sitting there and they don't they don't flinch they don't see anything about the children or how these mothers or grandmothers are are speaking with their emotional hearts they don't it doesn't it doesn't make a dent until you talk about money when we start to talk about money loss of power things like that we start to make a dent we start to be able to communicate in their language and that's you know that's part of the part of some of the difficulty that we're having because we're not engaging in um we're not engaging in i guess in the money part or in the pretend sovereignty or in uh, all the uh gaslighting tips that canada has given us uh to promote we're actually going back to our indigenous indian first nation roots and saying this is who we are, this is what we were told, this is what we're supposed to do. And if we have to remind everybody, it's fine. That's what matriarchs do, grandmothers do. We remind people, so we're reminding you. And we don't have a problem with that because that's a part of our role. And the, the men's role was always to protect us, to protect us and know that we were the homeowners or know that we kept the house. So right now, because we're unbalanced and unhinged and our men have become, they've lost their idea about protection and they've lost their idea about uh following through on ceremonies and having that balance in our communities they're businessmen now uh they've forgotten you know that to be a warrior is to be humble 
uh, they put on business suits. They're making deals. They have a hundred business cards. They're signing joint ventures, sitting on how many boards. They're they're happening. That's what they think it means to be successful and be a business person or compete in Canadian mainstream society. When you think like that, you are so far from your spirit and so lost from your people. Uh, and the fact that your people are starting to think like that, that's really horrendous. That's really a far cry from who we were meant to be here on this land. And if you don't have a connection to the land and you don't protect that land and you don't try to do something to advance things for the future of your future generations, you will lose that land. You will lose that opportunity. Uh, because, you know, studying Canadian law, there's one thing I've learned is Canadian corporate law, they make laws around you. There are laws that can be made around you. There are roads, things that are happening in provinces, infrastructure, where they can, you know, root around you so that your business isn't even considered. So I don't want to hear about economic sovereignty or how there's a golden goose that is going to protect us. Uh, the thing that has always protected our people is the creator, our belief in the creator, our belief in the land, our belief in ourselves and each other. That's what's going to protect us. I really like it. I really like what you're sharing. And it's given us lots to think about. I know some people will be hearing this for the first time. Um, I want to I wanna close off by asking you the question of, I know we identified oral history is really important, but, but what are key readings or resources people could f go out there and find to get up to speed or to maintain this critical um, analysis that we're talking about? Well, I think the first thing people should do is that they should go to the land. I think the first thing people should do is get to our sacred spaces or places and try to reconnect because, you know, it's good to have the readings and the teachings, but the strongest, the strongest, the strongest voice is already in the land. Uh, there are, you know, Jimmy Ochis points this out. You know, there are faces, our people are not only buried in the land, but we have, you know, stories of our creation stories about giants and uh, the other beings that were always here. And they are actively, you know, they're in the land. You can see them. And if you go to those places and, you know, it's not necessary that you do a big vision quest and they post it on Facebook and that, <laughs> you know, you have all the proper brave warrior clothes on or headband choker. You don't need that. Just uh, get to these places with a good heart, uh, no drinking, no drugs. Go out there and try to find uh, a space or a place where you can connect. It probably is, you know, your own land or your own territory. But if you're unable to do that, you can always find those uh, pockets of, you know, First Nation places where there will be something. Um, there will be something or an area that was you know, a passport that was by an old community, uh, something like that, some space or place. When you get to that space or place, you know, just ask the question, uh, have some kind of protocol, whether that's sage or uh, sweet grass or tobacco. Ask that question with a good heart, with an open mind and ask to be directed. And I think that those things will start coming to you whether you see somebody in your mind or you think of somebody, uh, your ancestors, your the spirits who surround you, your grandfathers, your grandmothers are waiting. They're waiting. I know some of our young people are very hungry for this, but they think they're going to find the answer in a book, a YouTube video, or better yet, a TikTok video because it's shorter. No, uh, there's no shortcut. You actually have to take the time and you have to. That's why I'm saying that, you know, for our, for our talks right now that we're doing for these uh, the cows and plows um, tour that's going to resume on uh, March 21st in Saskatoon, I'm saying that it's better if you get there in person because you're making the effort to learn or to hear, to hear uh, how we were taught. And that is to put yourself into that situation where, you know, we were in our villages or in our longhouses or in our whatever uh, structures we had, we had to listen. We had to learn like that. We had to listen. We had to be able to clear our minds and be able to sit in silence or sit in the, in the forest and hear, you know, whether the trees are talking or whether what's happening. 
uh, because we're so focused on social media, focused on our phones, I see a lot of people can't put down their phones. Uh, a lot of times I just turn off my phone because I don't, and I have no notifications on ever. So if people are trying to get a hold of me. I don't turn those on because there, I find there there is a use for that. There is a use for social media. I am using it to try to teach, but I also recognize that the best teachers or the best ways to learn are for me to be actually practicing those and doing them. And that way I'm uh, keeping that knowledge, that way of learning knowledge or that way of keeping knowledge going as well as uh, learning is lifelong. So I'm still learning and um, I'll keep learning until, you know, until, uh, until I finally pass away. But until that time, I want to make sure that I do as much as I can to help those who are here now. And Dee keeps saying this when we are talking in our talks. There's really nothing in it for us. I mean, there's no um, there's no money. We're not making, you know, we're not like downtown Calgary lawyers making two thousand six six hundred to two thousand dollars an hour. We're not making money like that for our time. We're not uh, clearing, you know, ninety thousand a year salaries like some of our organizations uh we're not doing that we're um we're getting help from people so we have gas money we're getting help from people sometimes a meal sometimes uh enough to buy sandwiches or enough for us to go sit in a restaurant and we're being billeted people will put us up people have used their points to get us rooms uh that's what we're doing in order to get the message out and that's why we're showing people it doesn't if you have the message and you have the heart and the conviction you will, and the faith, you know, you have the blessing of, uh, and the uh, guidance of the creator, you will be successful in what you're trying to do. That is what we believe our people, how we were, how we are now and how we always will be. And we're putting it just into action by doing it. So I would do those things first. And then, you know, next show, come back and maybe I'll have some books to read. <laughs> or if you are going to read some books, uh, should be by, you know, primarily native authors, uh, that are talking is specifically about, you know, the treaty or something critical analysis like that. And uh, I know that uh, um, my late dad wrote these mountains are sacred places. That's about the Stonies and uh, uh, the Stony people and sort of our history here in Southern Alberta. There are some other books out there that are uh, very good to give an overall picture for settlers like Daz Chuck and uh, Sarah Carter are very good. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of that guy's name. He's uh, Arco Sesne, the one you took a trip, or uh, uh, Tayaki. Oh, yeah, Alfred. Tayaki, yeah. Uh, I think his book is out now, too. I'm sure I haven't read it, but I'm sure that that book would be good. Like, I'm thinking of trying to think of authentic uh, First Nation people who are writing uh, in sort of the governance area, as well as Art Manual. Mm -hmm. Russ Dybel is finally on his book, so that is a must. Should be right up there with, uh, you know, the books that you will read. Uh, and uh, I just can't think right off the top of my head right now, because like I said, I guess I, I, I've i listened for most of my life. So that's where I'm getting my information or my stories. I haven't uh, I haven't read them. I've uh, lived them. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Amazing. Thanks for your time, Rachel. Uh, this is a lot of good information. I'm really glad you're here. I really appreciate the work you're doing. And of course, you know, me and Eli and your children, we grew up together dancing together and uh, send everyone my love and regards. And and I know this was really quick. We just agreed to do it real quickly and you jumped on. So I really appreciate your time and jumping on here. I think uh, you're missing a point because I told you yesterday was Mika's birthday. Oh, it was Mika's birthday. Well, happy birthday, Mika. I'll give her a <laughs> shout out. She'll listen to this right yeah. now. I haven't That's seen her in a while. <laughs> That's what I was saying. I was saying that. I said, I said, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I got Mika's birthday. But yes, thank you. I'm thankful to you guys as well. To Kobe, you, Jojo, your mom, uh, your spouses, your family, like uh, your late dad. You know, we've always been close to your family. We always love you guys and will assist, remember you, and also hold you up as uh, being the kind of people that we believe are going to help make the changes and the differences that we need to make for our people. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, then. Yeah. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>